welcome to Bow. It's Professor Nyamu's Anatomy Lecture Series. If you are just joining us, you are watching our video for the first time, or you have not subscribed, please do and be part of this great anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. In this lecture, this is the third part in our series of lecture on the brainstem. The part one was on the general features of brainstem and the standard features of medulla. And part two was on the internal features of medulla and related clinical anatomy. Part three, which you're watching now, is on internal and external features of the bone. And part four is on the internal and external features of the midbrain. So let's go to class. The bone is the part of the brainstem that connects the medulla or medulla blancata to midbrain and it lies anterior to the cerebellum. The length is about 2.5 cm and here in the section its anterior surface is convex. It convex with fibers running transversely to either side forming a bundle at each side called middle cerebral peduncle here and here. On its anterior surface, towards the junction of the pawn and the middle cerebral peduncle, here, we see the exit of the trigeminal nerve. And also on this anterior surface, we see a midline groove. And this groove is called the sulcus basilaris. This groove lodges a big artery called the basilar artery. In this second image, here we can see the pawn, and then at the center, lodged in the basilary sulcus or basilary sulcus, we see the basilar artery. Also, very significant on this anterior surface is the junction of the pawn with the medulla. In this image, we have here, that's this junction. This junction is called the ponto medullary junction. In this junction, we also see emergence of three other nerves. From here, we see the abducent nerve, and then from here, we'll see the facial nerve and the vestibulocochlear nerve. So these three nerves will emerge from the ponto medullary junction. This is the posterior view of the pawn. In this view, we will see the upper half of the fourth ventricle. This triangular part will form the upper half of the fourth ventricle. This is limited on either side by the superior cerebellar peduncle. That is the superior cerebellar peduncle limiting, limiting the fossa on either side. Now, at the midline of this fossa here, we have this median groove and the name is called the median sulcus. At each side of the median sulcus, we'll see a ridge. This ridge is called the median eminence. So this is the median eminence, one on the right, and the other on the left. Now, if you follow this median eminence laterally, we will see a sulcus. So the median eminence is limited laterally by a sulcus, and this sulcus is called the sulcus limitans. In this image, here is our median eminence. If we trace the median eminence distally, we will see this rounded swelling here on, on either side. This rounded swelling is called facial colliculus. The facial colliculus is a rounded area in the floor of the fourth ventricle, and it is produced by the root of the facial nerve as it was winding around the nucleus of the abducens nerve. 
Now, if we follow the circus limitance, this is the circus limitance. If we follow it proximally, we will see this colored area that is called the substantia ferruginea. Also, when we follow, when we move laterally, we will see another bulge that is lateral to the circus limitance. Here, we will see another bulge. This bulge is made by a nuclei in this level of the brainstem and the name of this nuclei is the vestibular nuclei and the name of this bulge is the area vestibuli or the vestibular area. We will now consider the internal features of the pawn. The transverse section of the pawn presents two regions. Here in this image, this is transverse section of the pawn. We will be seeing two major areas. Anteriorly here, anteriorly here we will be seeing an anterior part that is called the basilar part. And we will be seeing a posterior part, a small posterior part that is called the tegmental part. So a transverse section of the pawn will give us a large ventral part called the basilar part and a small dorsal part called the tegmental part. Now the basilar part here will continue inferiorly as a pyramid of the medulla and then it will continue laterally as the middle cerebellar peduncle. The tegmentum here is the upward continuation of the medulla that will be seen behind the pyramid. The internal structure of the pawn is studied at two levels, an upper level and a lower level. Now the structure of tegmentum differs in these two levels, while that of the basilar part does not change at any of the levels. We will first consider the basilar part. The basilar part is composed of three fibers and two nuclei. We have the longitudinal fibers. These are the longitudinal fibers. And we also have another set of fibers, the transverse fibers. And then we have the nuclei. So the basilar part has two sets of fibers, the longitudinal fibers the transverse fibers and the nuclei. These nuclei are the pontine nuclei. We will look at the longitudinal fibers. In the longitudinal fibers, we have three sets of fibers. We have the corticopontine, we have the corticonuclear, and then we have the corticospinal fibers. Now for the transverse fibers, these transverse fibers will pick their origin from the pontine nuclei, the ones I'm pointing, the dark ones, they pick their origin from the pontine nuclei and cross to the opposite side to form the middle cerebellar peduncle. And because they are running from the pon to the cerebellum, they are called the pontocerebellar fibers. Here are the pontine nuclei that are scattered within the longitudinal fibers. We will start our study of the tegmentum from the lower level. A transverse section of the pawn at the lower level is at the level of facial colliculus. Now, as we noted earlier, the structure of the tegmentum will vary at these two levels, while the structure of the basilar part will remain. We will start with considering the structures of the tegmentum at this low level. In this image, we will start with the absent nucleus. This is the absent nucleus, lying very close to the facial colliculus. Now, anterior and lateral to it is the nucleus of the facial nerve. And we see how the facial nerve spiral around the nucleus of the cis cranial nerve before exiting the pawn. 
Also, anterior to it is the superior salivary nucleus here. Now, on the lateral part of superior salivary nucleus, we are to see the nucleus of tractus solitaris, which should be here, but is not demonstrated in this diagram. Next to it is the vestibular nucleus. Now, here is the vestibular nucleus. And we can recall that it is the vestibular nucleus that gave the round, rounded curvature at the back of pon, which is called the vestibular area. Also, very on the lateral part, both on the dorsal and anterior part of the inferior cerebral peduncle, are the nuclei of the cochlear nerve. So we have the ventral and dorsal nuclei of the cochlear nerve. If we move anteriorly, we'll be seeing the spinal nucleus of trigeminal, the nucleus here, and the tract here. We will next consider the white matter. In the white matter of the tegmentum, we will start from the anterior part where we will be seeing the trapezoid body here. This is the trapezoid body. The trapezoid body is a decussation of the fibers of the cochlear nuclei of both sides. We can recall where we met this nuclei. We met them anterior and posterior to the inferior cerebellar peduncle. So that's their decussation at this point. The next structure we'll be seeing will be the medial lemniscus. So this is the medial lemniscus. We can remember in our lecture in, in, in the medulla, we saw how medial lemniscus was formed. Now, lateral to the medial lemniscus, we will have the spinal lemniscus. And if we go to the paramedian plane, we'll be seeing the medial longitudinal fiber, We'll be seeing the tectospinal tract and of course the next tract that's of interest is the tract of the spinal nucleus of trigemina. We will now consider the transverse section of the pawn at the higher level. This transverse section will cut through the pawn at the level of the trigemina nuclei. We will start with the cell bodies. In this image, we'll be seeing just two cell bodies, the motor nucleus of trigeminal nerve and the main sensory or principal sensory nucleus of trigeminal nerve, and they all contribute to the formation of the trigeminal nerve. These are the only two nuclei that we'll be seeing at, this, at the upper level of the pond. The white matter of the pond remain the same even at this higher level. The only difference here is the addition of more tracts. In the lower level, we saw the medial lemniscus and the spinal lemniscus. But at this level, we have additional two tracts. Here we have addition of the trigeminal lemniscus and also the lateral lemniscus. Also, the peduncle we have here is no longer inferior cerebellar peduncle, but we are seeing the superior cerebellar peduncle. The table we'll have here is a summary of the, of the differences of the structures of the pawn at the two levels. I will start with the gray matter. In the gray matter, the lower part, we were able to see the nuclei of the sixth, seventh, and eighth cranial nerves and also the nucleus of the spinal tract of trigeminal nerve. But when we come to the upper, upper level, we are, only able to, we are only able to see two nuclei, and these were the motor and principal sensory nuclei of trigeminal nerve. In the white matter, we saw just the two lemnisci, the medial and spinal lemnisci. But in the upper part, we saw the four lemnisci, the medial, the trigeminal, spinal, and lateral. If you also notice, the trapezoid body and nuclei were present, and also the trapezoid body here is either diminished or, or even absent. 
This table summarizes the functions of some of the components of the pawn. The pontine nuclei will serve as relay stations of corticopontine fibers and also give origin to the pontocerebellar fibers. The cranial nerves 5, 6, 7, 8 will have their nuclei at the level of the pawn. The pawn also has pontine respiratory center, just as also noted the respiratory center in the medulla. What the pontine respiratory center does is to modify the output of the respiratory center in the medulla. We saw a number of ascending and descending fibers, and what they do is to serve their motor and sensory functions. Arterial supply to the pond is via the basilar artery. Here is an anterior, anterior lateral view of the brainstem, and here we see the pond. This is the basilar artery, and blood supply to the pond will come from numerous pontine branches. These are the pontine branches arising from the basilar artery to the pond, and also from another branch of the basilar artery, which is the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. In our discussion on clinical correlate of the pond, we'll be focusing on millard gobbler syndrome, which is also called medial inferior pontine syndrome. We we'll also look at ponto cerebellar angle syndrome, and then we'll summarize with pontine hemorrhage. The millard gobbler syndrome or medial inferior pontine syndrome results from a lesion in the lower part of the pond. Here is the region that could be affected in this syndrome. Now, usually this is so deep that it can affect pyramidal tracts, it can affect the emerging fibers of the facial nerve, as we can pick it from here, it will also affect the emerging fibers of the abducent nerve. Now, what are the characteristic features of this syndrome? One, there will be ipsilateral medial squint. This is inward deviation of the eye towards the side of lesion. Why does this happen? Because the abducent nerve is involved. Two, we will have ipsilateral facial palsy. And why does this also occur? Because the facial nerve is also involved. And we also have contralateral hemiplegia. Why? Because the pyramidal tract carrying the corticospinal tract are also involved. The next condition we will look at is ponto cerebellar angle syndrome. This could come as a result of pressure exerted on the lateral region of the caudal part of the pond by acoustic neuroma. This is a tumor which develops from the Schwann cells surrounding the cochlear nerve near its attachment to the brainstem. This is the area involved in ponto cerebellar angle syndrome. So the structures involved in this syndrome are the nuclei of the fifth, the seventh, and the eighth cranial nerves. Here we see the spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve, dorsal and ventral cochlear nuclei, and then here we're, we're seeing the nucleus of the facial nerve. Other structures involved are the inferior cerebellar peduncle, flocculus of cerebellum, and choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle. Pontus cerebellar angle gives the following signs and symptoms. Well, we have tinnitus, progressive deafness, and vertigo, which is spinning sensation due to damage of the eighth cranial nerve. We'll see around here. We also have ipsilateral ataxia and staggering gait due to compression of cerebellar peduncle, also around here. We also have ipsilateral lower motor neuron type of facial palsy due to involvement of facial nerve here. There will also be loss of pain and temperature sensation and corneal reflex due to involvement of spinal tract and nucleus of trigeminal nerve 
around here. Lastly, we'll be looking at pontine hemorrhage. Pontine hemorrhage occurs due to involvement of branches of basilar and anterior inferior cerebellar arteries, ICA. If it's extensive and bilateral, the patient presents the following clinical picture. One, there will be pinpoint pupil, that is pupils that are abnormally small under normal light conditions. This is due to involvement of ocular sympathetic fibers. Number two, we have hyperparixia and elevation of body temperature above 106.7 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is due to abnormally increased hypothalamic thermoregulatory set. We also have deep coma because of involvement of reticular formation. And we have bilateral paralysis of face and limbs due to involvement of facial nerve nuclei and cuticospinal fibers. We have come to the end of this part of the lecture. The remaining part of our lecture have been discussed in subsequent videos. If you find this material helpful, you can share it, like the video, and be a part of PALS Anatomy Family, where we make anatomy simple by subscribing. See you in our next video. Thank you, and bye for now.